All right, why don't we begin? Uh, thank you for joining us um, today for our fourth and final webinar of 2019. Um, again, my name is Claire Powell. I am the Virtual Education USA Advisor for Education um, USA here in South Africa. And today we are going to speak specifically about applying to, the, to a US university um, with uh, the idea of preparing a winning application. So I'll be speaking to both undergraduate and graduate applications within the presentation. Just uh, wanted to ask if those that have joined us can just give me a little note in the chat to let me know that you can hear me. Please. Perfect, great, thank you. Um, so for interest of time, and because we are recording the session, I'm going to continue. Um, so a winning application, what do I mean by a winning application? Uh, it's more than just an application form, um, as we've learned quite um, significantly through general orientations, as well as, um, you know, the, the portion of researching universities. And we'll touch on a little bit more just to refresh um, the importance of finding the right fit before applying to a university, but also more just to understand that it's more than just simply filling out an application form. Um, and to explain why I need to start be at the beginning and explain to you briefly a little bit about the, the US educational system too. So as we've noted before, college and university institutional school is used interchangeably quite um, often in the United States. Undergraduate study is that leading to um, a bachelor's degree and graduate study would take you um, in order to be granted or awarded a master's degree or a PhD level degree. Okay, so just to understand those pieces of the puzzle. Okay. So research, what should you have thought of? Um, Basically, you need to seek out an institution or graduate program that is the best fit for you academically, socially, and financially, if you remember from webinar um, number one uh, back in October. Your application will be a winning one if you have carefully chosen those institutions which will want to have you on their campus or the ones that you best fit. So this, as we know, the selection is vast. There's uh, close to 5,000 institutions in the United States. Um, I would say just over, well, close to 2,700 of four-year institutions that award bachelor's degrees as well as graduate degrees. And then you have about 2,200 institutions that would award an associate's degree. So two-year course of study after high school, um, which is, so that's the two years or junior colleges that we spoke about during the research uh, presentation. Uh, about 283 universities are classified as research institutions awarding the doctorate degree. This doesn't include specialized institutions um, such as independent medical engineering or law school. So just something to be aware of. So given that there are so many, um, there will be some that will fit your needs better than others. And the diversity of institutions allows you flexibility in choosing what you want to pursue as well. Um, it's important that you give this thought and are very, very um, clear about exactly what you want, um, especially when it comes to master's and PhD level work. Um, so yeah, we know that the numbers are staggering, so you know where to begin. Um, as you can see on the screen, uh, some questions that you should have thought of before actually putting an application in. So again, we talked about what institutions offer and best fit your interest, but can you enter at any time or only in the four months, which in our South African calendar would fall around August, no pun intended, in August or September? Um, what is the actual application deadline? What are the financial aid deadlines for financial purposes? What's the cost of the university versus your budget? Um, and kind of what the process is involved there. Okay, the next slide gives you a pretty good indication of kind of how the US higher education system is structured. 
So high school earns a diploma after 12 years of formal um, education, and then they can go either to a community college for an associate's degree or go straight to a four to five year uh, bachelor level program. Okay. On then undergraduates earn bachelor's degrees after 16 years of formal education, and then there's various routes that they can take. So most areas of study, much like we have here in South Africa, would move you know, your two years of master's degree, um, and then two to four years, sometimes even five years for a PhD level degree. Um, if you're going into any of the specialized uh, professional degrees, of course, they're again broken up two years um, for an MBA, uh, three years of law school or four years of medical school if you're looking to become a lawyer or a doctor in the United States. Okay, so you want to make sure that you're applying into the level of study that is the most appropriate for you. Students with 10 years formal education, you know, wouldn't be a, applying for an undergraduate, for example. Okay. So a little bit more, as we said about finding the right fit, and probably okay, you've been telling us this so many times, but it's so important when you're putting your applications together. Um, you can't make any application a winning one if, you have, if you've chosen the wrong institution, one that doesn't meet your needs or that won't be interested in you. Not everyone fits the Harvard, Princeton, Yale student profile, and not all institutions have exactly the course of study that you need or that you want. An application can be winning only if it's be, being submitted to an educational institution that will give the application serious consideration. So, of course, you need to make sure it's accredited. You know, um, are there five to ten percent international students on campus so that you know that you have good support? The location's good, the cost of living near to friends and or relatives. Is it urban, rural? What's the climate? Does it suit your needs? Do you match the academic profile of an av average applicant? And does it meet your financial needs, um, or is it affordable? Okay. So if you recall from the general orientation, we spoke about the five steps to US study. And really what this is, the crystallizing piece of the puzzle of completing your application is step three, okay? Um, so you would begin obviously putting an application 12 months to six months before you step foot on campus. Um, so what I would say um, is important to do is make a list of universities that you're applying to and uh, to make a check checklist for each of the deadlines and requirements in separate columns. Gather your educational credentials um, and then decide, or if you haven't already done this, uh, take SATs, ACTs, GREs, you know, wh whatever's the most appropriate test as we discussed in the testing webinar. Um, and if you're not happy with scores, if you have time that's allowed to retake then, then do so. Um, you would need to request or follow up on recommendation letters. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but it's important that you've identified um, who the appropriate people would be for recommendation letters. Okay. And then a very crucial part of it um, that we spoke about last week is to write and rewrite your personal statement um, for undergraduates or your statements of purpose. Um, with regards to uh, graduate school. Um, so yeah, just something to, to be noteworthy of if you want to call. Okay. So what's in your application as an undergraduate? So you will have your application, your recommendation letters, and I say a plural of, of recommendations because generally for an undergraduate degree, they're going to want one from a counselor. So this would be someone, um, you know, in a, in a traditional sense that would be maybe a life orientation, a life orientation teacher or head of academics at your at your high school um, that would, you know, put through um, your transcripts, which is also known as your grade reports or your matric results, um, but will also write a short or a short summary of who you are and how well suited you would be for a program. Um, but they would also give a profile of what your school is like. So what the makeup of the student body is, how you fared in comparison, what the curriculum is. You know, there's a number of factors because universities like to read you in the context of what you've been offered. 
um, essays, um, as we said, uh, the essay at the undergraduate level um, and the essays, at, you know, for graduates, the statements of purpose at the grad must be approached in very different ways. And we'll talk a little bit more. Uh, we spoke quite a bit about that last week, about the difference of a, bit, a very personal side on the undergraduate essays, but on the graduate side, it was it's a lot more, um, how to say, you get down to business, why you want to study, what you want to study, what you hope to do with it in the future, um, and what you hope to bring to the program. So it's a lot more factual where the undergraduate um, essay is a lot more personal. Application fee, if you do, if you're not unable to get that waived, but as opportunity students outside of the normal um, scholars, you, you know, if you, if you feel that the application fee would be a financial burden, then you need to put that request in to the universities to offer you um, an application fee waiver. Um, and you'll see this, it can add up if you're applying to multiple institutions. Uh, your test grades, so these would be grades from your SAT or ACT. And then again, what I said earlier, transcripts. So these, this would be uploaded by um, your, your counsellor, um, the same one that would be doing your counsellor recommendation. So these would be your grade reports from your years of high school, including um, thereafter your matric results. Outside of the counsellor recommendation, it's important to note that you may be asked for two teacher recommendations. Um, so these would be other subject teachers that you have that would write recommendation letters for you to enter university. Um, they, on odd occasion, you could ask for a non-teacher to write what they term an other recommendation to speak about you outside of an academic setting. Um, but you would need to speak about what the appropriate makeup of that is with your individual advisors. Um, and it would also depend on what an individual university would want from you. Okay. So a little bit more on the application requirements for undergrads. Early decision is an option, but that has come and gone um, in, in most traditional senses. Uh, Early decision would either be, you know, basically between October and December, sometimes what they term early decision two deadlines would be January 1st. But it's essentially what early decision is, is that you put an application in, if you are admitted by the institution, a commitment is required. So often it's binding, which means, hey, if you get in, we expect you to come, okay? Which doesn't allow you to compare offers to compare financial aid offices. You know, it's, it's quite restrictive. Early action is a very similar type of application. You would apply early, find out um, earlier than the, the, the traditional sense. But um, if you are admitted, you're not committed. Um, yeah, you don't have, you're not committed to having to go. Um, it's not required, if that makes sense. Uh, so you could, like, for instance, if you decided to do uh, early decision to deadline, um, early action deadline to say Stanford, if you had done the November test uh, deadline, then you'd find out December 15th that you got in, then you could say, yeah, I feel comfortable, but I'm going to apply to other institutions, that's fine. Where with early decision, you don't have that luxury. Um, so it's just, you know, something to bear, uh, be aware of. Um, so early action and decision tend to be November 1 deadlines with an idea of giving you a response by December 15th, which is great from a South African calendar point of view, so you, you're not committing to a South African university. But um, yeah, it's early decision and action really need to be thought of carefully because if you haven't been able to put your time in to prepare a winning application, then it's it's not going to serve you any purpose and you'd probably be better suited to doing a regular deadline. Or in some cases, like uh, for instance, with smaller liberal arts institutions um, or, the, or the likes of Vanderbilt University, they might have a January 1st early decision to deadline with the idea of giving you response by the 15th of February. 
So that's another angle you could do. It's like, okay, I need to get through my exams, then I can work on a solid application, but I still want to find out a little bit earlier. Um, otherwise, you have to stick to the regular deadline, which tends to be between the 1st of December or the 1st of February. Okay. Sometimes after, especially if they're public or state institutions, you could have um, what we term rolling admissions, which I'll talk about in a second. But deadlines are important. You want to have your, your application in by those dates so that they can be considered. And it's, a, it's, a good, it's quite a key indication of you as a student if you can get all those pieces of the puzzle in. Um, but regular decision notifications would only come back to you um, in the month of March. Um, so just something to, to note um, that you're going to have a period of time between um, submitting an application and hearing back. Uh, as I was uh, as alluding to earlier, rolling admissions, so applications are accepted at any time before the start of classes for a particular semester. So whether that be the August, September fall, fall semester or the January, February, spring semester. But what I would say is students should apply as early as possible. And the reason why I say that, especially for international students, that if there is any financial aid available, um, it comes to a first come, first serve um, type of mentality. So you want to make sure that you're putting the best um, foot forward. Okay. So when I was referring to educational credentials, what was I meaning? So with regards, um, you know, you need to take note of what might be. So it might be your actual matric certificate, it might, it might be your grad, um, your grade reports, your final grade reports from grades 9 through 12. Um, if you have attended university, it could be uh, extra credits um, that you've taken at that level that you would potentially like to transfer to an institution. Uh, but it's important to take note of what they may want from you. Um, so remember that reports, final national exam, uh, transfer credits, if you've already taken some uh, courses at a tertiary level, uh, it would be depend on the university what they request of you from educational credential category. Okay. Standardized tests, we spoke uh, in depth about this both um, as part of the general orientation video but also um, with webinar two uh, with regards to standardized testing. Remember the tests may that you may need to take. Lucky, luckily if you were at an English medium school or university then you may get away with not having to take English language ability tests. So that's something you want to check with with um, the institutions on. But if you can get away with that thing, then you're in a good space. Okay. Um, a little bit more in depth on the recommendation letters. Who can write them? So school head or principal, a counselor, a tutor or, or teacher, a sponsor or a coach. With regards to graduate level students, it would be um, you know, professors, administrators, or employers, but you need to choose someone that knows you well without having too much familiarity, like a family member or a friend. Um, what they tend to need to include is uh, your academic and professional work, and also need to indicate your potential to do well. And basically, what I like to determine is how you stick, stick out or how you are unique in comparison to the rest of the group that is around you. Um, so, yeah, what I would say is after today's presentation, do check out the Google Drive because there will be resources within the folder uh, for uh, in relation to the, today's webinar um, that will strictly speak about how recommendations should be put together for you. Okay, um, so just something to be aware of. Okay. Um, Personal statements. Um, again, you need to show who you are from an undergraduate level. Um, who you are, be clear and concise, be persuasive, and include your strengths and skills. Um, 
so with regards to undergraduates, you're really just showcasing you as an individual. With regards to graduates pursuing masters and PhD students, it's more centered around goals, as I said before. Um, but there is going to take time and you do need to work on these. So putting rough drafts together, having a review done, uh, brainstorming, reflecting on it and writing another draft and possibly a third draft before you get to a final product. So just something to, to understand. Um, when it comes to application, you need to remember to relax. It is going to be a lot of personal reflection, especially when it comes to undergraduate applications. So there can be quite a bit of self-discovery. You need to allow time to conduct research on the institutions that best suit you. And you also need to allow time to complete your application. So with regards to undergrads, the nice thing is in most cases, you can put forward, um, how do I say this, put forward or subscribe to the likes of the common application or the coalition application where you have one login, one application for multiple institutions that you fill out and that application will go out to all of them. You don't have to sit out filling up one application after the other. Um, it does still take work because, yes, there are questions that may be individual to an, uh, an individual college, but with the graduate institutions, it is going to take a lot more time because you have to be that more specific to a program at a university or, the, you know, the researchers that are working there or the research that you want to conduct there. So you do need to allow yourself the sanity and the time to work through that. What I can't stress enough, and many uh, higher education representatives have said this to us, you do want to make sure that you pay close attention to all directions that are being asked of you. Actually answer the question that is being asked. Um, don't make up what, or write what you think they want to hear. You know, once you've written something, go back to the question or the, the question stem, as I like to call it, and make sure that you have actually answered what they've asked of you. Okay, and really you can do it. I know it's a lot of paperwork and Tyson, but you really, really can do it. Okay, um, and that's really it. Is <laughs> I'm going to stress it again. If you remember nothing else from my presentation, remember that. Remember this. Um, this can result in your application being incomplete and not reviewed, and it, it is a source of frustration for. Um, reviewers, you need to read directions and follow them. Okay, apply early before the deadline. Um, I don't want you to be sitting there on New Year's Eve trying to throw together an application. Um, so avoid the stress, give ample time. Um, you know, ample time does produce the best work. It saves you money um, and it shows that you're responsible and can follow the instructions, which will create a good impression. Um, I've said this many times before, but I'll repeat it again. Early, um, begin early and you will win. Your research into the institution that you apply to will shine through in the application, especially when it comes to the short answer questions from an institution like, why do you like us? Why do you want to apply to us? It will show that you, you're serious and you've done your homework on an institution when making a selection, and this creates a very important first impression to the uh, reviewers. Okay, so I always say show, um, show them, don't tell them why they should look at your application. Um, your application is the only thing that they have to compare you to other applications. It's the first impression. It defines who you are and what you will add to the institution. Um, so download the online app if at all possible fill it in with a rough draft, have others edit it or, or um, you know, correct English, edit for the incorrect English or uh, incorrect spellings and make sure the info is honest, accurate and consistent. Okay. Um, when I say show, don't tell. Also, if you are writing, you don't just say, oh, I am kind and a wonderful person actually give them anecdotal evidence as to why you're a kind and giving person. Um, so if you've created your own NGO or um, community project that 
we'll highlight that if that makes sense. Okay. More tips um, that I would like to give you in regards to filling out applications. Explain discrepancies if there's been a long break uh, between completing high school and beginning universities. Um, or if, for instance, you did really, really well in grade nine and 10, but your grade 11 marks dipped massively so, um, explain that. Uh, you know, it gives context to your application and, and can really help. Letters of reference, uh, choose them wisely and give sufficient time for them to complete it. Um, we all are getting into the end of year crunch, so um, you want to give them, you know, you want to tell them now in order to make sure that they would do a recommendation before the 1st of January, for instance. Um, print and type clearly or prepare a rough draft before submitting it online. Use exactly the same name throughout your application and put your name and return address email on all correspondence, um, like subject line, or if you are sending transcripts, let's say, or reports via mail that it is clearly stated, okay? There really is more to a winning application than just an application form. Recommendations or letters of references must be well done. As I said, you must choose someone who knows you well, likes and respects you. And if they're not proficient in English, have them write the recommendation in their native language and send for a translation rather, um, and have the translation of English attached. Because um, I think then you get a more honest, thoughtful recommendation than having them not write it correctly, okay? It's a small slip ups that can make your application into an, uh, to an institution a failure, so you wanna make sure you're avoiding them. Okay. Of course, because this is such a long time, be patient, we know it's a virtue. Um, the hardest part of the, it's, you know, hardest part of the admissions process is being patient. Uh, it's appropriate to follow up and the communication with university officers um, and faculty. Um, just kind of don't hound them all the time because it, there's a difference between trying to keep them yourself fresh in their minds versus irritating them. So be able to know how to follow up uh, can turn an application into a winning one in many instances. Check to be sure all the info is in your file. Things that can um, Things can and do get lost. For instance, for some reason, they can't up, um, download a recommendation from one of your recommenders. Um, so keep copies of everything and resubmit if necessary. And don't be afraid, especially if your counselor has said they have submitted something. Um, don't be afraid to speak to your Education USA advisors because many admissions officers are willing to take um, copies from us. Um, in order to sit and read your file before asking, you know, before following up on anything official if necessary. Um, you know, sometimes if it even costs too much to send your test scores to universities, um, they are willing to take the scores from, from us if we can verify them uh, for the universities. And then if you are enrolled into the university, then they'll ask for an official report. Um, from the testing agency. So there are ways to make sure that a university is getting all the information that it needs. Okay, in conclusion, um, it's really important that you start early, do your research, read directions, and follow instructions. Apply early, keep a copy of everything, and be patient. Um, as I said, you're gonna be, in most cases, submitting an application in January, in only hearing in March or April if you've been accepted or not. So it can be quite quite a process. Okay, um, I'm going to open it to questions uh, and let you ask what you would like to ask. What I would say um, is make sure that you reach out to your appropriate advisor um, to speak to them and you know, to follow up after this, and then also to check out the Google Drive. I did send an email out to everybody um, this morning with a link to the YouTube channel page. 
as well as the Google Drive for you to access um, the resources and handouts that um, best coincide with the various webinars that have taken place over the last month. And these will help you quite tremendously so um, in getting your applications completed. Uh, I will upload um, the necessary completing your application resources over the course of this evening and tomorrow morning so that you can access them where necessary. Um, but if you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the chat box now and I will answer them as we go. Thanks, Portia. If anybody didn't receive the email, but I'm guessing people did because they have joined us today. If you didn't receive an email, just um, send me an email at cpowell um, at educationusa.org. I'll type it again into the chat group so that um, I can make sure you get a copy of that email that I sent today. Any other questions about um, completing your application, the timelines, or any of the components involved? For undergraduates, what I would say is, if you go to the YouTube channel, last year I did, I think it was an hour and a half presentation on actually completing the common applica application online, and that you can follow through step by step and play and pause where you need to in order to fill out the various parts of the application. So what I would, I would highly recommend that you watch that video and use it in, in order to complete your common app. Okay. So, um, so Yasmin's question came through. Um, South African universities start earlier than the decision for US ones would arrive. What do we do if we end up starting at a South African one before we learn about acceptance? Or do we not go to the local university? I'm always a big believer, you don't put all your eggs into one basket. Okay, so my recommendation is that you begin at a South African institution. Okay, um, you can't um, put your life on hold necessarily. It's, not, it's never a guarantee that one is going to get in. Um, you know, <laughs> generally when I've rolled the dice in with my advising, what I would say is the students that chose to start at a South African institution generally were the ones that got into a US institution. The ones that tended to be a little bit are like, no, I'm going to get in. There's no problem. I'm not going to start at a South African one were the ones that often ended up in kind of limbo, if you want to call it. So generally, my advice is that you will you can start in the February at the South African institution. You should know before the end of March whether or not you've got it into a US one. That would allow you enough time in order to deregister from a South African institution without much of a penalty, if anything, um, of having to pay much of anything for, for your place there. So that's just something uh, to be aware of. Um, but that's a great question, Yasmin, so thank you. Any other questions about the application submission? Um, all the process of applying. If you are, what I, I would say, if you are looking at anything in the arts, so fine arts, performing arts, uh, play, pay closer attention to deadlines because what often happens is, yes, the institution itself would say, oh yeah, our application closes on the 1st of January. But if you're any, wanting to do anything in the arts, you often have to submit um, a portfolio of some sort or look for a, um, 
in or, or hopefully do an audition. So often what they want is they want the application about a month earlier. So they would ask for the application to come in on December 1st rather than the 1st of January. Um, so just keep an eye out on that because you don't want to get caught out um, on a small technicality like that. Um, so just be aware of the deadline, not only for the institution, but maybe for your individual area of study. But it tends to be okay um, with most areas of study barring anything that might need examples or additions. So application for funding. The general rule is that it's due within two weeks to a month after submitting your um, admission application, but I always go with the thought of submitting it at the same time. And the reason why I say that is um, it's just good to get it all out and in the open so that everything is out at the institution at once and then you can deal with any snags or hiccups um, afterwards. So if an application is due on the 1st of January, I would submit the, fin the financial aid application at the same time. Great questions, Scott. Anybody else? So the question again on financial aid is um, you need to submit ISFA or not CSF. If you can submit ISFA, go ahead and do that. But you do need to speak to the individual universities about it. Um, not all of them will necessarily accept ISFA. They may actually have, let's say for instance, Yale, would rather you fill out their own individual financial aid application um, if you can't afford to do the CSS. Um, or you know Princeton as well they have their own form so it's just something to be aware of and uh, and look at um, so again when I say you you make kind of a spreadsheet or a list of your universities and then another column with the deadlines do the same with the financial aid uh, that fun you know make a list of what their preference is in, in terms of that um, I know CSS is expensive um, it is the quickest way to get the information to the universities, but you know when you look at the rand dollar exchange rate, it, it can be burdensome. But you need to ask the individual universities what they want. Um, so yes, it, you might end up spending more time filling out multiple applications um, in order to save yourself. Um, I think it's sixteen dollars. Yeah, um, per per application. So just something, yeah, something to be aware of. And remember CSS and the ISPA is generally, generally aimed towards undergraduates more than it is to graduates. But again, you have to speak to the institution to show that up. I'm going to leave it for one more minute um, for any questions that may be out there. Otherwise, I'm going to let you go and enjoy your um, your afternoon. Um, if you were late or uh, didn't catch the full presentation, you are welcome to join um, or head over to our YouTube channel tomorrow morning. There will be a recording of the application um, up for you to have a look at. And just to reiterate, the recording will be on the YouTube channel and resources and handouts um, that coincide with today's presentation will be up on the Google Drive um, tomorrow morning as well. OK, 
Okay, if there are no other questions, I will hopefully speak to you all at some point. Never be afraid to reach out to myself um, if, if you have any questions or to your appropriate advisor. Um, they, they are there to help, as am I. Um, we want you to submit the best applications you possibly can. Um, and yeah, I know this is a crazy time for everybody, um, but wishing you all the best of luck. Um, I know you will all do great um, in, what, in what you pursue. Um, and yeah, stay, stay happy, stay sane, uh, stay safe also during um, this period of the year. Okay. Thanks, bye. Well, take care. Bye-bye.